sources of legitimacy, God, religion, the church, the pope, the sovereign, emperor, king, monarch, the state, parliament, the law, the people, tradition, custom, when in Rome do as the Romans do, paternalism, family, parent, expert, dependency, need, illness, poverty, reason, science, medicine, health, the self, individual rights, autonomy, what legitimizes one person's getting what he wants from another. In family relations and in Christianity, dependency and need. Infants have a right to get protection and support from their parents. The poor and the clergy have a right to get protection and support from the rich. This is why parents must be responsible for their children and the rich must be responsible for the poor and the clergy. In war and in despotic totalitarian countries, power. The victors and the rulers have a right to get from the vanquished and the people what they want. This is why the weak must be submissive toward the strong. In capitalism, money. Persons with money have a right to get what they want from those willing to give it to them in exchange for money. This is why the free market tends to equalize human relations, making capitalism not only efficient, but also ethical. Formerly, God was our grand legitimizer. Today, it's mental health. For anyone who doubts it, I offer the following supporting evidence. I recently lost my wife. At the wake, knowing that after the casket was closed, I would not see her again until I joined her in eternity. I shed a few tears as I said goodbye and planted a farewell kiss on her cold and silent lips. The clergyman, I'm a former clergyman, became highly incensed because of having the viewing in the first place, talking to my wife while she lay in her casket and kissing her. After the viewing, he telephoned me and laid me out in lavender, suggesting I was a mental case and in need of a psychiatrist. Abby, what do you think of this minister? Ben from Brockton. Forgive your minister. I think he is a troubled man, and his behavior should be reported to whomever is his superior. As in the age of faith, everyone's behavior, especially that of the prince, was contingent on its being viewed as legitimate because in conformity with God's design. So, in the age of mental health, everyone's behavior, especially that of the therapist, is contingent on its being viewed as legitimate because in conformity with criteria of mental health. How else could we account for the fact that Ben's minister illegitimates his parishioner's behavior by pronouncing him in need of a psychiatrist? That Ben, himself a former minister, seeks to restore his legitimacy not by consulting the Bible or Christian tradition or his own conscience, as a Protestant minister in the past might have done, but by submitting his case to the judgment of Dear Abby, a leading authority on mental health. And that Dear Abby herself uses the vocabulary of psychobabble to illegitimate the illegitimizer by categorizing him as a mentally troubled man. Declaring that one does not like Jones is much weaker than diagnosing him as mentally sick. If we describe our adversary in plain English as hostile or threatening, we continue to recognize him as fully human. But if we diagnose him in the defamatory rhetoric of psychiatry or anti-psychiatry as mad or mentally ill, then we no longer recognize him as fully human. Herein lies the appeal of the madness-mongering imagery and language of both psychiatry and anti-psychiatry. Each renders the speaker effortlessly superior to his adversary. Physicians stubbornly believe that there are two types of pains, organic and psychogenic. The organic, they insist, is caused by a lesion in the body, the psychogenic by one in the mind. In fact, physicians do not experience and cannot properly classify other people's pains. What they experience and classify are other people's complaints, complaints of pain which doctors consider legitimate they validate as organic, those they consider illegitimate, they invalidate as psychogenic. Hence, it is a mistake to believe that organic pain is one kind of pain, and psychogenic pain another kind, the former standing in the same relation to the latter as, say, ureteral colic stands to biliary colic. Instead, organic pain is a legitimate complaint and psychogenic pain an illegitimate complaint, the one standing in the same relation to the other as, for example, Real money stands to fake money or counterfeit. Anything, declares sports writer Wally Hall, that could sideline a man who had the promise and potential, Bill Brown did, has to be considered a disease. Announcing that something, 
anything is a disease has become our favorite indoor sport. Like reflagging Kuwaiti tankers to justify treating them as if they were bona fide American property, we pin the label disease on anything and everything so that we can legitimately think or do whatever we want to think or do in the mindless pursuit of our momentary self-interest. Language, the oldest and still most reliable guide to a people's true sentiments, starkly reveals the intimate connections among illness, indignity, and illegitimacy. In English, we use the same word to describe an expired passport, an indefensible argument, an illegitimate legal document, and a person disabled by disease. We call each invalid. To be an invalid, then, is to be an invalidated person, a human stamped not valid, by the invisible but invincible hand of popular opinion. While invalidism carries with it the heaviest burden of indignity and illegitimacy, some stigma adheres to virtually all illness, to virtually any participation in the role of patient. Inanimate objects and animals exist in physical space, and their behavior exhibits regularities, which we call physical or biological laws. Human beings, qua persons, exist in social space, and their behavior exhibits regularities, which we ascribe to their obeying or disobeying God's laws. Natural law, the moral law, the laws of monarchs, parties, or electorates, the principles of psychology, or the dictates of their own conscience. Being in harmony with the prescriptions and proscriptions of law, be it God's, the state's, the medical professions, one's own, gives rise to a sense of legitimacy, its absence, to a sense of illegitimacy. Because we are spiritual social beings, the human desire for legitimacy may be even more basic than the desire for life itself. Sometimes some persons want to die, but no one ever wants to be illegitimate. Illegitimacy par excellence is an ascription no one attributes to himself. Even the person guilty of a grave moral sin or crime, a Judas, a Lady Macbeth, a modem mass murderer, views himself not as an illegitimate person, but as a legitimate sinner or criminal. In short, legitimacy is to us what water is to fish, the milieu in which we as spiritual beings live and hence notice only when we are deprived of it by others. Revealingly, when we deprive others of legitimacy, we tend to blind ourselves to the subject's situation as he experiences it. We insist that his situation is caused by his condition, not by our definition. Indeed, no sooner do we perceive an illegitimate actor's situation as due to our own doing than the negative ascription quickly loses its legitimacy and disappears. The concept of illegitimate child is a case in point. Thought to be tainted by a moral defect of his parents, such a child was believed to be significantly different from a legitimate child. Mutatis mutandis, an insane person thought to be tainted by a chromosomal defect of his parents, is now believed to be significantly different from a sane person. But if insanity is a type of illegitimacy, the question we must answer is, is it fair to categorize a person as insane? I believe it is unfair to the so-called patient when the categorization is used to incriminate him as mentally ill and justify involuntarily confining or treating him, and it is unfair to society when it is used to exculpate him as not responsible for his actions, publicly support him without expecting socially acceptable behavior from him, and exclude him from the category of persons we regard as morally deserving of punishment. Because man is a social animal, he must live in a group and secure a measure of cohesion in it. The best and easiest, and perhaps only way to do so, is by means of the dramatic persecution of the other, as in crusades, witch hunts, wars on Jews, drugs, and mental illness. Moreover, because man is a moral agent with a sense of right and wrong, he must justify legitimize his existential cannibalism. The best and easiest, and perhaps only, way to do so is by means of the dual claim that the controlled destruction of the other is necessary. One, to protect the purity and safety of the group, and two, to save the sole mental health of the other. How are these rationalizations supported? In the age of faith, by belief in immortality and prayer for the other's soul. In the age of reason, by belief in mental health and the expenditure of vast sums for fixing the other's mind or problem. Prayer for his victim's beneficiaries not only absolved the man of faith from guilt for his existential cannibalism, but made him positively proud of it. Similarly, the obligation and willingness to expend vast, tax-extorted sums on our victim's beneficiaries not only absolves us from guilt for our existential cannibalism, 
but makes us positively proud of it. When people now debate whether psychoanalysis is or is not a science, they act as if they were talking about verifiability and falsifiability, when in fact they are talking about justifiability and legitimacy. Why do we ask or want to know whether psychoanalysis is or is not a science? To decide whether insurance companies should or should not pay for it, and why should it make a difference to insurance companies whether a particular intervention called therapy is or is not scientific. Because only if it is scientific will the state recognize it as a legitimate treatment and require insurance companies to cover the risk of needing it and to boot make practitioners liable for tort damages if they do not provide such treatment to patients for whose diagnoses it is appropriate. Thus has the alliance of psychiatry and the state corrupted not only psychiatry and the state, but science itself. Authorities, political as well as professional, legitimize their power by claiming that they are saving men, women, and children from one scourge after another. During the 19th century and the first half of the 20th, they saved us from sexual self-abuse, masturbation. Now they are saving us from chemical and existential self-abuse, self-medication, and suicide. Affirmative action, coercion in the name of justice, involuntary psychiatric intervention, coercion in the name of treatment. The pen, the proverb tells us, is mightier than the sword. C3F course, the sword needs the pen to legitimize it. The distinction between the rightful defense of God, country, and self, and the wrongful killing of the innocent depends on the pen. Authority legitimizes, the individual justifies. Legitimacy rationalizes, rationality legitimizes. Legitimacy is weakened by defiance. That is why it seeks consensus and compliance by persuasion, if possible, by coercion, if necessary. Rationality is strengthened by defiance. That is why it is indifferent to consensus and eschews coercion, and why its motto is, a word to the wise is sufficient. The 19th century intellectual saw more clearly the differences between legitimacy and rationality than does his modem counterpart. With the odor of sanctity lingering in his nostrils, he recognized that legitimacy, often tied to power, is likely to be coercive, whereas rationality, typically tied to knowledge, is unlikely to be so. In contrast, having replaced God with reason, the modem intellectual, believing that rationality justifies legitimacy, resorts readily to the coercive control of those deemed to be irrational or unreasonable. Perhaps better than anyone, Voltaire understood that only he who is legitimate can successfully wage war against the legitimizers. Asked by his secretary what he would have done had he lived in Spain under the Inquisition, Voltaire replied, I would have worn a big rosary and gone to mass every day and kissed all monks' sleeves and tried to set fire to all their monasteries. Almol.